Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Christopher Brown, and today we are heading to the province of Saskatchewan to sit down with the mayor of Saskatoon as we continue our year-long series on municipal leaders from across this great country. Please help me welcome the mayor of Saskatoon, Charlie Clark. Mayor Clark, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be with you. Uh, so, Mayor Clark, let's start with the very first question I've asked every single political person who's ever appeared on this show, and you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Yeah, I, I think probably the biggest influence on my life when it comes to that was my grandfather, Fred Ritchie. Um, he <clears throat> was an active citizen in in his life and in, in, in so much of the work that he did. And, and he was also this person who had the ability to, to live life with this sense of, of gratitude and gratefulness um, and, and, a, and, and a, in relationship with people that made me realize, you know, as opposed to focused on himself and focused on his on meeting his own individual needs, that I, I think that really affected me and, and made me realize that, you know, a, a meaningful life is very much one that's, that's led um, by being part of your community and, and trying to help create situations that that help people be their best people and uh, and for me civic politics and local politics is is a place where you know you're, you're ultimately just in a community of people who who want to live a good life and, and be in a good community and and, um, and being you know in that civil civic politics sort of realm is a, is a really good opportunity to do that so you could have given back in many different ways through nonprofits, through volunteerism. You could have helped out your community that way. But in 2006, you decided to put your name on the ballot for Ward 6 local councillor in the city of Saskatoon. What was happening in 2006 that made that switch go off in your head and said, okay, now is the time. Now is the time to get out of the behind the scenes and get on the ballot and give back to my community that way. Okay, uh, probably three things uh, that I can think of that were really key. One is I was I had a young son. My wife Sarah and I had had our first child, Simon, and we were uh, had committed to living in Saskatoon as a place to grow. And I'm from BC originally, um, and we had met in Winnipeg, moved to Toronto, came here a few years earlier, and there was a sense of community here and a sense of you know of, of this. Um, this really strong um, so community mindedness in Saskatoon that was very strong. And there was also a sense that all the young people were leaving that the, the narrative was, you know, what, what happens in Saskatoon is people get a degree and then they pack their bags and they leave. And so we train people to go and, and to, to build lives in other places. And we had cho chosen to stay and, uh, and wanted to preserve that sense of community that we saw here that we didn't necessarily see in other cities. So that was one. Secondly, um, our city was going through a very painful -ish time because the Stone Child Inquiry report had come down, which was uh, in response to uh, charges that had been laid against police officers who had dropped young Indigenous uh, men off on the edge of the city. And in some cases, people had had died and and it was a very painful time in the city and, and there was an increasing sense of division and tension um you know uh in the community around that issue and then third there was other really <clears throat> uh, active polarizing issues that were spinning pitting basically this this issue you either had to pick with developers or you had to pick with anti-developers and, and everything was breaking down in those two ways that um, or suburban versus er, uh, downtown kind of living and I came from a mediation background I came from a background of, of looking at how do you find the common ground between perspectives and not allow a very divided way of thinking on any of these issues be what shapes the way decisions are made because I believe that actually what you need to do is to, to find ways to, 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 um, to, to bring together perspectives as opposed to being divisive. And I was challenged by people in the community in a way to, 
to get involved. Uh, it wasn't my first instinct. I was actually quite terrified about jumping into politics myself. I, why I, was but... that? What was the terrifying part of that? Because that's where this whole show comes from is why get into politics? Because you're not the first person to say they were terrified about the idea of putting their name on that ballot. Well, we had, like I said, a very complicated and, and emotional and, and, you know, uh, intense issue around indigenous you know the, the relationship between the indigenous community and the police i didn't know what the answer to that was but i knew that if i stepped in and became involved i was going to become somebody who couldn't just sit on the sidelines and complain about what goes on but that i'd have to try to have an impact and then i'd have to um make decisions and then the newspaper would report my decisions and then i could be criticized for what i did right or, you know, the, the the sort of big fundamental questions of what kind of city are we going to become? Are we going to be a sprawling city? Are we going to become a vibrant urban city? Are we going to become, you know, a, a city um, that uh, that continues to foster community or, or, or that it becomes because we're, we're, you know, in a, in a time of change. And so it was the fear of having to actually be somebody who who. Uh, <laughs> People can criticize. <laughs> and has, has that fear the... uh, has that fear gone away since uh, 20, 2006 when you first got elected? Or does that fear still stick with you that the decisions you make might get criticized on a day to day basis? It's very intense. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> it's because uh, unfortunately, as you know, things haven't gotten any simpler. I mean, when you end up in a situation where, you know, you go through a pandemic and you watch uh, your, you know, elements or people within your community start to actively um, sow ideas of, that, that of doubt and all institutions, all government, the healthcare system, any sort of science, any rational discussion and, and the power of conspiracy theories and sort of generating that. And then sometimes people in politics actually exploiting that and trying to engender that. And, and the, the, um, the shift that's happening away from being able to just like sit down and talk about real issues and facts and, and, and people operating at least on the same set of information has been really challenging when we also have the impacts of inflation, the impacts of technological change, the impacts of climate change, the impacts, you know, of living in a city that's more diverse than it's ever been, you know, a global city and, and trying to, uh, you know, foster a climate you know an environment of discourse and decision making government that actually continues to 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 try and bring forward good ideas and evidence-based decision making hasn't gotten any easier <laughs> but so yes that that well, while it of, hasn't gotten easier you're the mayor how do you make that work though how do you make it work where we're living in a different world than we lived in three years ago. Yet again, we're living in a different world than we lived in about a year and a half ago compared to where we were in the midst of the global pandemic. How do you, as mayor, navigate the issues that are going on when we are so polar, uh, like a polar opposite in the different camps that we've put ourselves in in our communities? Because I can imagine that's probably the hardest job as mayor is to try to bring everyone together when. Everyone doesn't see everything eye to eye right now. Yeah, a couple of things. One is that I know that I can't, you can't on every issue bring everybody together and get everybody to agree. And, and you know, and, and that's, that can be paralyzing, right? You, you <laughs> have to still keep moving forward and uh, and trying to, to, to find, you know, to make sure that you're being clear about why you're making decisions and giving, being clear about your values um, and making decisions, you know, uh, um, I've also learned one of the, probably the most important lessons that I've learned is that even though you're the mayor and everybody thinks that you're perhaps all powerful and that it's everything is your responsibility um, to live in that way that you actually, you know, that sort of top down idea that, you know, it's I, the buck stops here and I'm the one that, you know, um, has to solve everything and fix everything that uh, I have a favorite definition of leadership that I talk about often um, by a fellow named Marshall Gans. Um, and it's that leadership is about accepting the responsibility to create the conditions for others to achieve shared purpose in the face of uncertainty. So 
Uh, it's a bit long, but each part of that is important. And basically what it says is that you have to build a good team. You have to trust the people around you and you have to find people who who have the same, you know, sort of approach to decision-making, problem-solving, and you have to ensure that they have they have the authority and the opportunity to be their best selves and bring their best selves to the table, and you have to support them and, and uh, to bring you the best advice and decisions to make good decisions and to, cl- and to foster that climate. So it's, it's not, you can't foster a climate of people being afraid of you or being or, or, or feeling like they can't make a mistake because the mayor will be, will be upset, whether that's my administration, my council, my community advisors. Um, and that is absolutely fundamental that, you know, no one person can navigate difficult situations alone. You have to build a strong team. Even when Michael Bloomberg became mayor of New York City, he's talked about this often. And, and people said, what are you going to do in your first 100 days? Because a lot of people test you and say, what, you know, what are you going to perform in the first 100 days? He said, build a good team. And then people say, yeah, but what are you actually going to do? He said, build a good team. And um, I, I think that model of leadership is essential. You trust the people around you. You support the people. You, you, you make sure you have diverse opinions you, and, uh, and you build it up. How important is it to have a good working relationship with your fellow councillors as mayor? Because you say you need a good team around you, but the team that is around you at the council table, you don't get to choose. The people of the community of Saskatoon get to choose who their councillors and who represents them. How important is it to trust that process when it comes to making decisions that while you may not agree with councillor X or councillor Y, at the end of the day, you have to work together for the betterment of your community. Yeah, it's it's the essence <laughs> of local democracy, right? And and it's why I like civic politics more than, uh, and I haven't been in provincial or federal politics, but the fact that you're not, you know, um, the, the, the fundamental framework isn't partisan politics and that you, you build your own team of people who you, everybody agrees with and then your job is to go and, and undermine the other. But in fact, you, you end up with whoever gets elected, as you said. And on our council, we have people who are historic, some people who've ran federally conservative, some people who've ran NDP, some people who've ran uh, liberal. And, um, and so then you end up with a... You, that group of people and uh, and I think for me what's really important to try to help foster a climate where we understand that we will not always agree on every opinion or every issue but we need to listen to each other and respect where each person comes from and uh, and and keep that that climate of of uh, of, of the human side of, of all of us and, and respecting that each person was elected so so that's that's the role and um, and essentially separating the person from the problem, right? And and so I think we have done quite well in Saskatoon at that. Um, and in a world, like you said earlier about, it's becoming more polarized and becoming more, you know, um, shifting from people disagreeing to people seeing each other as the enemy. That's a very dangerous aspect of, of what can happen in democracy. And for me in Saskatoon, it's been important to, to try to offer people a different alternative to that every every step I go. But at the same time, we have some people who are, are, are really trying to drive that sort of conspiracy theory, us versus them narrative. And I don't, I also have, to, don't spend a lot of time trying to convince them to see things my way either, because I- But will I, you talk to them though? Will you will you have a civil conversation with them if they're willing to have a civil conversation with you? Because I'm the same way. I'm willing to have I'm willing to sit down and talk to anyone as long as we can have a civil conversation about the issue that's at hand. Once it gets into name calling, I've stopped the conversation. But are you as mayor willing to sit down with both sides of an issue and say, okay, let's try to come up with a solution here that works for everyone and not just one side or the other? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I have always, you know, made sure that I try to talk to and listen to, to people um, in ter- and, and especially if I know they see things differently than me. It's tricky now where there's where there's in some situations people who will want to leverage a conversation to keep spinning, you know, a, a narrative and it's not really a real conversation. And I, I, I do draw a line there where um, I can see that it's going to be used to help 
build build something. And unfortunately, now I think people, in some cases, can even use it to draw more. It's almost like fitting into to making money and stuff like that, you know, and 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 that kind of thing on on social media and and getting enough subscribers to build ads. And so there's sort of a, a weird. We're in a weird time, but I do. I do believe everybody has something to say and that, that, uh, that, that underneath whatever their anger or their, their, their um, disaffection or distrust of, of, of what's going on is some grain of truth. And, and it's worth, you know, making sure to not shut down to that. You have just, you, you have spoken right to my heart, Mayor Clark, because I am a big believer that people do take things out of context. And that's why in this show, we do not edit. We do not edit the con- the interview as is, unless there's audio issues, because we can go back and say, no, this is what he said. You're taking the person out of context. This is right. what the person said. So I'm very happy you said that. But before we turn to segment two, I have one last question before you, because this is the most important part of this line of questioning and uh, for segment one. And that is the personal and the public persona of a local councillor. As an elected official, municipally, locally, you are the frontline politics. You don't go off to Regina. You don't go off to Ottawa. You are in your community 24-7. You are Mayor Clark if you go to the grocery store. You're Mayor Clark if you go to a restaurant. I can imagine that can get tough. I can imagine there's days that you just want to be Charlie. I can imagine there's days that you just want to be dad and husband to your family. Have you found that balance of work and uh, life to ensure that the job doesn't get to you? Because I can imagine, especially as mayor of a big city like Saskatoon, it can get challenging to do both and stay stable through it all. Yeah. I, well, it's, you know, it's been a real journey. I, I was mentioning my son, Simon, who was a year old when, when I, I got elected. So he's 17 and graduating from high school now. And we have a 14 year old uh, son, Ben, and, and, um, and a 12 year old daughter, Rachel. So their whole reality and their, you know, uh, has been having their dad as either a city councillor or, or as the mayor. It's be what well, the way we've kind of managed it is that for a while they would come to events with me and they'd be part of that kind of experience. But as they got older, I, it became clear that it's important for them to live their own lives and to not have t- too much of their identity shaped by that they're they're the mayor's kid, um, you know, because that can be a double edged sword in a lot of ways. And they need to be able to to shape their own identity. So they're they're not. They they come and and are part of my works more occasionally now than than more often, um, and that seems to have worked out. I hope fairly well. We you know um, the pandemic actually became this one of the weird you know I know people talk about silver silver linings was that it actually meant I was home every night because there were no events in the community there was nowhere to be there was and 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 spent a lot more time with the family and that that actually helped me re re kind of establish that relationship because I, and I realized how much this job had taken me away from, from that. So, and, and now, now that we're sort of back to sort of events and all those things, I think I have a bit more perspective and balance when it comes to that in terms of the sort of people seeing me and as mayor, as opposed to seeing me as Charlie. And it, it is always a funny thing. Cause whenever I go to a grocery store or something, Yes, people will come up and talk to me sometimes, but also people just know who I am and they see me from a distance and you sort of feel like you're just trying to pick out the mushrooms and the, you know, the, which bag of apples you're going to get. And, and and to some extent, you don't like our people uh, paying attention or not. And so, but it's just, you know, it's just something you kind of get used to. Uh, and, and, and actually, I think so much of the time people think about politics right now as the angry sort of you know that people are just mad and complain and all those things and the reality for me is that when I'm out there in the community 99% of the time I talk to people it's it's I have nice conversations and and people talk about our community and they're and they're very um respectful and polite and and uh and it actually is a good reminder to me that what we see on tv and what we see on social media is actually not an expression of of, of the true way people see or, or believe the world is and that's been been a good lesson too. 
I want to turn to segment two and the very first question I want to start off with, and I want to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion at council. This is not a policy of council. This is his opinion. We seem to get a lot of emails from people who say this is not what council's talking about. They're talking about X, Y, and Z. So Mayor Clark, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue today as of recording facing the city of Saskatoon? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> It's hard not to really see the the crisis that we're facing around overdoses, homelessness, addictions, mental health, um, as uh, and and really the you know the the trauma and the intergenerational trauma, especially in our community where we have the history of residential schools and and um, eighty two percent of the people who have been identified as homeless at any given time as uh, identified as indigenous. Um, you know, the impacts of, of the combination of, of, of some of that history with the toxicity of the drugs that are there and the destabilizing experience of the pandemic, I think, and the difficulty of finding housing is just, it's just, it's a terrible, awful situation that's creating a, a whole range of uh, devastating impacts on families, on, on people, on, in, on young people, um, and on neighborhoods. And so, um, and it, and it does not lend itself to easy solutions. And I, I know you, Mayor, Mayor Glenbeck and I talked about having this conversation with you. And, you know, whenever we've talked with the mayor, if I'm talking to mayors of across the country right now, everybody is talking about the, this, this challenge and, 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 and the impact it's having. So that is a, a big one. Um, so how do you address it? Because that is a national issue it's a provincial issue but a lot of municipalities right now are feeling the crunch to address that issue on their own how is the city of saskatoon addressing the social issues that are affecting their your community right now because i can imagine it's hard to do this alone but you kind of have to because it's affecting your community it's not affecting other communities outside and you are the mayor and you have to try to address it so how are you and council trying to address this issue right now yeah so we're we're building you know partnerships uh are, are we're actually reorganizing as a city how we um take some responsibility for this because you know because we don't have a department that deals with homelessness and housing we're actually now doing a complete review to make sure that we have some, some of our staff who are doing this all off the side of their desks convening coordinating you know problem solving identifying opportunities to get programs in place um you know our fire department has become this really active player if you talk to our uh, assistant fire chief yvonne raymer she knows the names of um so many people who are homeless in our community and where they've been and where their encampments are and and they're they're really trying to understand the realities that people are facing a big area the, of of change that's happening in our community is that the saskatoon tribal council um which is the uh, a tribal council that brings together seven different first nations uh who are in the region and and provide services both on reserve and in the, in the city has become a much larger player in providing uh, supports the people who are homeless, and um, and that indigenous-led, given the the population, um, that has been a really important um, uh, you know development in order to help connect people back into culture, identity, to 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 uh, I, create a welcoming environment that that you know people really feel is is familiar if they come into the wellness center or or places like that. That the, that the tribal council has been operating, the, the Métis Nation has been taking on more and more of, of this work. And so the city is not the provider of the solutions and um, we don't have the infrastructure to do that. But what we're really trying to do is to create that continuum of care, support the creation of a continuum of care to address it. And we need more, we know we need more treatment beds and we're advocating to the province for that um, and treatment beds that aren't just for the based on the 28 day model that you know uh, was originally um, established but but that actually is long enough to, to help deal with the impacts of something like crystal meth um, and so I am constantly talking to officials within the provincial government and we're working with the federal government and trying to get them as coordinated as possible to 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 address it um, and we're making some progress, but uh, it feels often like the 
the impacts of these drugs and other things is the more progress you make, it's like the, the problems, um, gen the challenges escalate as quickly as you can try and respond. How do you balance the macro issues versus the micro issues? Because I can imagine if I go talk to 100 people in the city of Saskatoon today and I ask them that exact question that I asked you, what is the biggest issue? They might say the park in my area needs upgraded. The pothole in front of my house needs fixed. The sidewalk needs to be repaired. How do you as mayor look at the issues and think to yourself, okay, we need to look at the city as a whole, but we can't forget about the issues that are important to the people who are making up this community, like that pothole, like that uh, sidewalk. How do you balance those smaller issues with the larger issues when it looks at, when you look at budgeting and when you look at trying to move the city forward? Yeah, it's uh, it's true. And some people say, well, you you know, if anybody's got to pick three priorities and operate on those, and we don't actually get to do that because we, we run people's transit service. We, you know, we're responsible for policing. We're <clears throat> responsible to make sure that water is coming into people's houses. And then when they flush the toilet, it's going, you know, somewhere safe and, um, and, uh, and that they can get to work. It goes back to my earlier comments, you know, there have been times as a city, when I especially was a city councillor, where I could see that our roads were in such bad shape and our ability to get snow cleared was was uh, not working to the point that people were losing confidence in our ability to do anything as a city. And, and so if you can't get the sort of basic things taken care of, then you uh, you're going to have a very difficult time. Like we're also wanting to build a new downtown event and entertainment district and and take on some big projects that are can be very controversial and challenging. And if you don't have enough confidence that you can keep just the the kind of uh, core core services for running, then there's no way you can take on stuff like that. And the way to do that is to try to build a good team. Is to really work to make sure that your staff you're you're um empowering them and providing them what's needed to innovate to bring in the technological solutions that are needed to adapt you know it's been really important for me to try and support and create an environment where people on the front lines are actually uh, empowered to, to bring solutions because the people who are there whether you're driving a bus or you're driving a, a grader or you're you're working directly with the crews that are doing that often know what's needed to improve things more than somebody who's in a senior management kind of position and isn't actually there on the front lines and so you have to try to build that that culture within the city that uh, that can and we've we've made some really great progress in how we've cleared snow and we you know we we had a guy who was who was a supervisor come up with an idea to clear Circle Drive, which is, uh, you know, in Saskatoon with with high speed plows instead of graders moving at 20 kilometers an hour with a police escort, and it shaved eight hours off the entire snow clearing um, timelines for the whole city because they just came up with a new way of of, uh, of of grading the streets. Some genius in our sign shop came up with a way of signing the, the streets when we needed to co tow cars for street sweeping um, in our city that that was just a really <laughs> it's just these triangle uh, signs that created reduced a whole bunch of headaches that in, in terms of how we were towing cars and people weren't getting informed and we were trying to get into people's mailboxes but they didn't look in their mailboxes they threw stuff away and they'd just be mad <clears throat> and this way nobody can deny they know when the streets are coming to be swept and it, these kinds of things are really important but the mayor doesn't have those ideas so you got to make sure your your staff can have them so I'm going to ask this last question because you just opened up a can of worms that I want to make sure I get on record here um City Council's uh, staff is only the CAO. You, your CAO is the chief administrative officer for the entire town, for the entire city. They're the ones who talk to uh, dictate policy, whatever council says they go and they do. You're not going to talk to the greater operator and saying, what are the issues that you're seeing? So that way I can address them at council, right? You're saying that there's a process within the city of Saskatoon that the information from your greater operator or that sign guy gets to city council in an appropriate manner, right? I'm just making sure I'm getting, hearing that right or is it 100 yeah. okay, okay. But, but what i'm trying to do is tell okay. my city manager hey and we're sharing like 
books on on organizational leadership and change and saying like the way the only way any organization is going to survive in this complex environment is to make sure staff uh, have an outlet to share their ideas. And so that, you know, I, and any time I have a chance to talk to our managers, our directors, I simply try to reiterate that, that, that our people are our best resource to help us deal with, with the challenges we're facing. And, and then I don't sit down with them and, and like try and figure out what signs to put up. It's just, that I try to foster that environment in, in terms of how we're running the city. Understandable. I want to turn to my last segment because I'm cautious of time here and we're a few minutes away from having to wrap up. And I want to talk about tourism. Uh, now, I'm going to be in the city of Saskatoon in late April for a certain conference that is being held by the Saskatchewan Urban Municipality Association. I'm looking forward to being there. Okay, good. Uh, yes. So, uh, Randy and I, we're, I'm good, we're going to be doing some live episodes there, hopefully, if everything works out properly. Randy Golden? Yeah, Randy came on the show and we had her on the show. We talked about the upcoming conference. So I want to know, because this is coming out in March, as tourists descend upon your city in April, what should they be doing? What are some of the hidden gems that people don't know about that as a tourist to your community, they should be going to see? Yeah, I mean, it's not a hidden gem, but the army Wasson river valley is is something that uh <clears throat> is is so worth uh exploring and 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 getting out there and, and just being able to be in a in an urban environment and and in nature i went for a run this morning along there but you know before it was light and, and and it just restores me every time i do it and i'm so proud of 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 that we're in a city where we're we have that that publicly accessible sort of uh, network and and um, <clears throat> it's, it's exciting and we're, we're working towards creating one of the first national urban parks um, around that around the, the, the success of the Miwasan Valley. Um, you know, I think it's it's important for people to uh, have a chance not just to explore the downtown, but to explore some of our really cool <clears throat> historic streets like Broadway Avenue, <clears throat> like the 20th Street in Riversdale. And 33rd Street and Sutherland, uh, where there, where you see the flavor of our community, the local shops and businesses, and and uh, and and great, you know, whether it's sort of craft stores where you can buy gifts or or, or restaurants where you can experience some of our local food. Um, Wanaskewin is an amazing place, you know. By by April, well, we might still have some snow, but you know, you can walk into the. Uh, uh, Opimihau Creek Valley and 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 ex sit there and imagine what it would have been like to live in a place where there were many people living over over winter uh, but before there were any roads houses you know wood construction you know what, what it would have been like to live with the bison as as your main source of food clothing um, and uh, and housing um, and uh, and be, there's also medicine wheel, archaeological sites, um, uh, bison jumps, and that's a pretty incredible, unique experience that, that we have that uh, uh, I, I really invite people to think of, to, to go see. And um, yeah, and I hope everybody here experiences the, the incredible hospitality and friendliness of the community, which I talked about as being inspirational for me when I first became involved and moved here as, as something that stood out compared to other cities that I lived in and I think really is still there uh, and I hear that for people who visit or who have arrived as newcomers. Every time I went to Saskatoon when I lived in Lloydminster, Saskatchewan, I always felt like I was home, even though it wasn't my home when I, where I lived. I lived in Lloydminster. So I, I have very, very fond memories of the city of Saskatoon. I'm very much looking forward to seeing it again in April. But I want to end on this question. And this is a very important question because it gets to the crux of what you've just talked about. Mayor Clark, what makes the city of Saskatoon such a unique place to live to work and to raise a family. Oh yeah, I mean, it, it's it's one of those cities that is rooted in the city that could. You know, the the, the early um, city builders envisioned this city on the prairies that would become a city of three hundred to four hundred thousand people. We are now just about to get there, but they designed it in a way that has these great 
streets and 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 the, and they fought hard to make sure the university would be here as an anchor and then there, there's this really strong history of of industriousness and entrepreneurialism and we also were a city founded on a relationship between chief whitecap and john lake you know in the early days you know uh, where the, the even the site of the city was chosen as a result of of an in, of, of a trusted interaction between uh, between a First Nations leader and, and the founder of the community. That hasn't been the whole history of our city, as, as I talked about. You know, we've, we've got a lot of experiences of, of racism and of discrimination. We also have something called the Saskatoon spirit here, which is about, um, about people coming together and, and finding ways to work together across different, you know, um, sectors of society, across diversity. And, and ultimately, in the world today, I think that's that's really um, something I feel really proud of here. We just had an event where uh, an organization called People Bridge Advocacy was launched, and it's made up of primarily people who are from different newcomer communities, and each and and leaders from each of those communities who have become bridges within our community to to make sure that they, whether you're in the South Sudanese community or the Karen community or the Syrian community or the Afghani community, um, they connect with each other and with indigenous elders and leaders uh, who are part of this, this network and they've built relationships with each other. And which is a teaching within our, our treaty relationship that relationships are the start of any, uh, of, of any work you're gonna do. And here I think there is people who really see that and want to foster it and it's, creating a city and an experience of a city that that is is quite vibrant and exciting um, as we also are trying to meet the world the world's needs with the products that we're we're producing here so um, I guess that's the way I would answer that I'm not sure if that's quite answering your question Chris but uh, it does uh, it certainly does but I want to take a moment and say thank you thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down for the last 40 minutes uh, Mayor Clark and talking about your community uh, I'm always impressed when I sit down and speak to municipal leaders because they are the frontline politicians and they're the ones that are the the politicians that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and they make the biggest impacts on our life so thank you for making a big impact on the community of Saskatoon I look forward to visiting the city of Saskatoon in April. I'm looking forward to being at La Suma, but I'm also looking forward to visiting some of those tourist spots and maybe taking a run myself or for me, a casual leisurely walk because I'm not as in good shape as you are to uh, go through the valley. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for doing this and greatly appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Chris, for highlighting the everyday, you know, that as I say to kids, like the mayor puts his pants on one leg or her pants on one leg at a time, just like you, and um, and and trying to close the gap that people feel between them and and the and the people who end up in politics is important and humanize it. So, and I can see that's what you're doing um, because we need people to keep wanting to get involved in this work, putting their hearts into it, and and trying to do it in a collaborative way. So. Um, I think that's what I get from this interview that you're you're wanting to bring out in people too. So thank you I, for doing that. I'm trying to humanize people and that's the best thing I can do. So with that, reminder to everyone, get off social media for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. We'll be back on Monday for another great episode. Talk to you then.